This is the first session of the Foundations of Finance. To me, finance is at the heart of almost everything that you do in a business. Remember the old saying, it's about the money? Sounds crass, but in business, that is always true because no matter what aspect of business you're talking about, strategy, marketing, human relations, public relations, it's still always about the money. That is how I think about finance when I teach my corporate finance class and when I teach my valuation class. In fact, I'm often asked, what's the difference between the two classes? And there's actually a very simple way of describing what the difference is between corporate finance and valuation. In corporate finance, you look at a business from the inside out. You're looking at financial decision making within a business. How do you run a business well and how do you create value in the business? In valuation, you're looking at the same business from the outside. So with the driving notion that it's always about money, what I'd like to talk about in this session are six building blocks that you need no matter what finance class you take. Now, this is my subjective judgment. There might be others who believe there are other building blocks, but these are the six building blocks that, to me, make up finance. The first is finance is a very simple and, at the same time, very complex way of looking at businesses. So we're going to start off with the concept and structure of a business, at least as we see it in finance. And in the process, we're going to lay out the philosophical foundation for finance, which is it's always forward-looking. It's not about what you've done in the past, but what I expect you to do in the future that drives the way we think about decision making. The second big concept we're going to talk about is cash flows. Finance is all about cash flows. As opposed to, as opposed to what? As opposed to accounting earnings or book value of assets, it's always about cash flows. Understanding what drives cash flows, why they're different from earnings, the different types of cash flows is central to understanding finance. The third is the notion, the driving force of risk. Everything in finance is built around measuring risk and making sure you are earning a return that is sufficient given the risk you've taken on. So in the process, we've got to define risk, we've got to come up with measures of risk, and we've got to come up with perspectives on risk. Sounds strange, but I'll talk about that in a moment. The fourth big idea on which finance is based is the time value of money. You all heard the saying, right? A dollar today is worth more than a dollar a year from now. But why? Understanding the intuition of time value is central to also understanding why currencies matter and why the time value of money itself might shift across time. The fifth big building block for finance is understanding the basics of value. How do you value a, cash, a set of cash flows? What if those cash flows are contractually set? What if they're residual cash flows? What if they're contingent cash flows? understanding the basics of valuation. And finally, while financial markets might not be necessary to run businesses, they are the lubricants that allow businesses to run well. Understanding trading is central to finance. In fact, every trader likes to make money without taking any risk. And in, in, in fact, you'd like to invest no money, take no risk and make money. It's called arbitrage. Understanding what makes arbitrage so difficult in markets is again central to thinking about finance. So let's take a step in, each, in, in the right direction on each of these six concepts. Let's start with the concept of a business. You've seen financial, uh, an accounting balance sheet, right? You've got assets, you've got liabilities. A financial balance sheet lays out the core of how we think about businesses. In a financial balance sheet, you're going to see assets and liabilities just like you do in an accounting balance sheet. But unlike an accounting balance sheet, in a financial balance sheet, when we think about assets, we think about not what you've already put into these assets, what you've invested in them, but what we expect you to make from these assets in the future. It's always about the future. And that's going to change your perspective on what you see on the asset side of the balance sheet. On the liability side of the balance sheet, I like to believe that in finance, we keep it simple. Simple in what sense? There are only two ways you can raise money for a business. One is... You can borrow the money, that's debt. The other is you can use your own money, that's equity. As you expand as a business, the layers of debt and equity might change, but they still remain, there still remain only two ways you can fund a business, debt and equity. The second big idea in finance is cash flows. We make a big deal about cash flows in finance, and it's, it's useful, it's critical that you understand 
why cash flows can be different from earnings. Because often the raw information we have on companies takes the form of accounting information, accounting earnings. Understanding why cash flows and earnings are different is important to understanding why some businesses that look good on an accounting basis might not be worth very much and others that don't look good on an accounting basis could be worth a lot. The second big idea in, in cash flows that I'd like to get through is that cash flows can take one of three forms. They can be contractually set at the time you enter into an agreement. That's what you get with a corporate bond, a bank loan. They can be residual cash flows, which is what you get when you're the owner of a business or an equity investor, or they can be contingent cash flows. What are, what are contingent cash flows? The cash flow will happen if something else happens, if an event occurs. Understanding those different cash flows is useful in valuing those cash flows. Then comes the concept of risk. We are, as human beings, risk averse. We say that all the time, but what does that mean? Understanding how we came to that conclusion or that we are risk averse is central to starting to think about risk. And to convert that risk aversion into our decision making, we need to do two things. One is we need to understand that risk is not a bad thing. Risk is not something to avoid because to become a great business, you often have to seek out risk, but you have to seek out the right kind of risk. Risk is a two-sided beast. It's got good si a good side and a bad side, and you want to make sure the trade-off works in your favor. The second big idea we're going to promote is that when you think about risk in an, in an investment, you've got, you got to ask the question, risk through whose eyes? Think about a publicly traded company. You've got thousands of shareholders, you've got managers. Each of them might have a very different perspective on the risk in a decision, whose risk should dominate. And thirdly, we've got to convert that risk perspective into a risk number, something we can bring in explicitly into decision making. You could actually argue that the history of the development of risk measures closely parallels the development of finance as a discipline. The fourth big idea is the time value of money. If you've taken a finance class, you undoubtedly have a financial calculator. Take a look at that calculator. Take a look at all those buttons and take a look at that PV button and look at how worn out it is. It's amazing how much of finance is a present value problem. In fact, every finance class starts with that nostrum. A dollar today is worth more than a dollar a year from now. But why? Understanding the intuition behind why a dollar today is worth more than a dollar a year from now is central to finance. And converting that intuition into mechanics. In other words, if I get to give you a series of cash flows, can you bring them back to today? Or can you move them forward to a different point in time? That's a skill that anybody who claims to be in finance has to have. Which brings us to valuation. We'll have an entire class on valuation, but I'm going to start off by saying something that I truly believe. Valuation is simple if you keep it simple. We choose to make it complex. In fact, I'm going to argue that to understand valuation, you've got to go back and think about those three kinds of cash flows I talked about. Because the way we approach valuation is actually dip different depending on the type of cash flow. For contractually set cash flows, the way we do valuation is we use the promised cash flows and we discount them back at a default risk adjusted discount rate. That's how we value a bond. The promised cash flows are the coupons in the face value. The default risk adjusted cost of debt is what we use to discount them. For residual cash flows, we estimate the residual cash flows. Those are expected cash flows. We discount them back at a risk that reflects the risk we as investors see when we invest in those residual cash flows. That's how we value equity. For contingent cash flows, we need a different toolkit. We use option pricing. We'll talk about the basics of option pricing, but if we can get those three concepts down, we can value just about anything. And finally, there's trading. As I said, financial markets are the lubricant that allow businesses to operate. So understanding the notion of buying and selling, the notion of trading, is critical to understanding finance. So let's start off with every trader's dream. Every trader's dream is to find something risk-free and make more than the risk-free rate, or put differently, to be able to invest no money, take no risk, and walk away with profits. That's a pure money machine. That's called arbitrage. In practice, it's almost impossible to find arbitrage. If it exists, it, it's there. It's transient. It's there, then it's gone. 
So we're going to talk about the frictions in the marketplace that cause it to disappear. Why is it so difficult for sure things to exist in markets? And we're going to talk about two big frictions. The first is trading costs. Now you're saying, that's easy. This is the $4.95 I have to pay when I trade. Not so fast. Trading costs are much deeper. They include other items that we don't even think about when we trade. So understanding those trading costs are central to understanding why free lunches are so difficult in trading. The other is taxes. You've all heard the old saying, right? There are only two things in life that are guaranteed, death and taxes. And I'm not even sure about death. Taxes are an issue in investing. They have to be an issue because as investors, when we invest in companies, we get to spend after tax cash flows. So bringing in taxes into decision making, into trading, into investing is central. So let's lay the foundations for how taxes enter into the process. Those are the foundations on which we're going to build these corporate finance and valuation buildings. So let's make sure we get these foundations right.